Начинается наша... Let me welcome everyone. Hello. A section of uh, state governments of local and uh, NGOs. We have three sessions ahead of us. We've uh, suddenly moved to Zoom. Even first, it seemed to be quite a wild idea, but now it seems to be just where we belong. So thank you to all our speakers who are with us. So you are the first ones today. So that's a section for April. I'm Irina Messianova, head of the Research Center for Civic Society and Commercial Sector. I can't quite see whether we have a multi translation, which was promised how this works. Let's check. We're gonna tell you. We're gonna tell you. All right. So. Значит, смотрите, у вас внизу есть глобус между кнопкой чат и запись. Когда вы на него нажмете, вы можете выбрать канал, русский или английский. Uh, Linda, at the very bottom of the screen, you can see the globe. Mm -hmm. you, touch it, you can choose the language, either Russian or English. That I will speak? No, you uh, speak English, but then later, if you can, you know, would like to... Okay? <laughs> can you hear the translator? Так, Настя, у нас есть переводчик -то? русский язык, то а, Линда Кук выбирает английский, то мы будем слышать только переводчика, мы не сможем слышать Линду Кук. Ну, так и говорили, со мной так на всех апрельских. Да, ну, Соответственно, не это а, Линда Кук говорит по-английски, кто хочет ее, может слушать mm -hmm. по-русски, не слышит ее английской версии. Да, это так. Ну, тогда все, я надеюсь, выбрали нужный себе язык, и переводчик у нас на месте, и наша сессия называется Роль гражданского общества в решении задач социально-экономического развития. И первый доклад представляет целый коллектив факторов. Это вот Линда Кук, Елена Степановна Яковлевна Смирнова и Анна Васильевна Тарасенко. И сам доклад называется «Outsourcing of social services to social oriented non-governmental organizations in the Russian Federation, federal policy and regional responses». И я это переведу, на самом деле, за главой, поскольку это очень важно – это реально аутсорсинг социальных услуг, социально ориентированных некоммерческих организаций в Российской Федерации. Федеральные, как бы, как правильно сказать, господи, федеральные э, политики и как бы ответ регионов. И поскольку в период с 2011 по 2017 год сотни миллионов рублей были выделены в виде грантов на поддержку э, НКО, именно правительством Российской Федерации. Поэтому особенно интересно это исследование. И я с большим удовольствием предоставляю слово Линде, а презентацию будет делать Анна. Я правильно понимаю? Давайте попробуем. All right. Um, thank you all for coming. This project, <coughs> this paper comes from a joint project that was, has been carried out by by <clears throat> Anna Tarasenko, Elena Yarskaya, and myself, and uh, I'll tell you when to switch to. And it was supported in, in, by the United Nations Research Institute uh, for Social Development. This is set on outsourcing of social services to non-state organizations, primarily um, the socially oriented non-governmental organizations. Okay, and Can we go in a one slide? So introduction. Outsourcing was actually was introduced in in Russia, in the Russian Federation in 2013. But in the several years before its introduction, there were numerous programs of federal grants from the presidential administration, the Ministry of Economic Development, and others in order to support the development of, of social. <laughs> 
Did I continue? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in order to support the development of um, socially oriented NGOs as well as their collaboration with regional governments. This is significant because it means that the federal government, before it, it developed these policies, actually spent a lot of time and money trying to laying the ground and trying to introduce the concept and practice of cooperation with regional governments. First major legislation was in 2013. It set up a system for procurement of goods from 50% of goods providers, both, uh, both non-governmental and small businesses. And finally, in 2015, the most significant piece of legislation on the basis of social services for citizens of the Russian Federation, which, which created an, which allowed for an open-ended expansion of sourcing. And it is mainly on the implementation of that piece of legislation that we have focused our study. And next. Okay, so why adopt outsourcing? There are several reasons. First, to respond to public dissatisfaction with social services, which was reflected in, in many opinion polls. Uh, the citizens most continue to hold the state responsible for providing services, but are often unhappy with the quality. So the uh, involving NGOs was designed to bring competition, client choice, and higher quality into the social services market. It was also designed to reduce costs and increase efficiency based on the principles of new public management. And it matters that social service provision is a symbolic issue for attracting public support in elections and for political leaders, both at the national and especially at the okay. Next slide. Uh, Putin, in his annual address in December 2016, called on governors and municipal authorities to attract nonprofit organizations to, uh, to the maximum to perform services. He said, we are all interested in the active arrival of, of NPOs in the social sphere, leading to an increase in its quality. So that was the key, that was the key motivation. Okay, one more. How does outsourcing work? <clears throat> outsourcing works through a process by which uh, potential providers of social services, non-governmental, non-profit, also small businesses, apply to regional governments, apply to regional authorities in order to be accepted as qualified providers in the social service registries, in the social service provider registries of the regions. And so regional governments perhaps inevitably served as gatekeepers for the participation of non-governmental organizations in outsourcing. They would review the applications, decide whether or not to accept an, an particular organization into the provider registry. And this would mean that non-state actors would, to an increasing degree, carry out tasks that had in the past always been done by public sector workers. So the legislation was double-edged for regional governments. On the one hand, it provided an opportunity to improve quality of services, strengthen popularity. On the other hand, it would reduce already overstretched funds to maintain the state social sector. Uh, the first thing we looked at was the, the general picture, federation-wide picture of implementation, the percentage of non-state providers among all provider types in, I believe this is in 20, um, I should have the date, um, at, at three years into the, the implementation, so in 2017. And you can see that the levels of implementation, um, Anna, can you, Put the slide up a little bit so we can see the percentages on the bottom. Um, perhaps not. You can see that, so these, these uh, blue lines represent the percentages of non-state providers in regional social service provider registries for most of the Federation. Uh, and you can see that those numbers vary greatly from regions that had almost no and no non-state providers to regions like Bashkortostan at the bottom that had a large majority of, of non-state providers in their registries. So we see that overall that implementation varies greatly across the Federation, but that for the most part it is relatively modest. The largest number of, uh, of regions 
have relatively small numbers, smaller numbers in our judged by the major study that we use, the um, study by the Ministry of Economic Development in 1919, are judged to still be sort of at a, a beginner level. Okay, next slide, please. So our research goal was to explain regional variation in compliance, uh, that is the varying percentage of non-state providers accepted into the regional registries that we saw in the previous slide. Why, and we ask why did a relatively small number of regions readily restructure their social sectors and have significant proportions of non-state providers? Other regions made modest changes in nearly half made relatively few changes in the first three years after the legislation came into effect. Okay, next slide. So we looked at, <clears throat> we looked over all the regions and in using a study again that was done, carried out by the Ministry of Economic Development at the end of 1918, which is the most recent uh, information, the, the most recent comprehensive data we had available when, when we did the study, we chose we divided the regions into three categories, leaders, compliers, and beginners. And we chose from each category two regions, uh, Bashkortostan and Permkrai, they were at the top, numbers one and three in the federation with very high percentages, non-state providers. St. Petersburg and Karelia were in the middle. Moscow and Saratov Oblasts were near the bottom. The first row shows the percent of non-state providers in their, re in their regional provider registries. And the second row shows their rankings if, uh, among all, all, all the regions in the Federation. We took two regions in each group that were different in, in socioeconomic, um, socioeconomic conditions and levels of urbanization. And we compared, um, and we tried, to, we looked at explanations for why, for what might, what, what could account for the, the different performance of these three sets of regions. Okay, next. All right, we had three proposed explanations, institutional resources, the size of the, of the NGO, so, socially oriented NGO network, or the number per 10,000 population in 2014. This would give some sense of the, of the basis of institutions that could fulfill the functions designated in the reform. We also looked, and this is Anna Tarasenko's uh, great suggestion, I think, at political resources, regional leaders' commitment to outsourcing. And we used as indicators their hosting of regional forums with public chambers. These regional forums were, were designed to, to focus on and develop um, contracting, outsourcing in the regions, and, and they were also a way of attracting the attention of the central government, the federal government, and of, of um, showcasing what regions had done. And also we looked at which regions took initiatives in, ME, in the grant competitions uh, carried out by the Ministry of Economic Development beginning in 2011. Thirdly, we looked at economic and financial resources thinking that wealthier regions would be in a better position to add songos um, to their social sectors, while those that were poorer would have starker choices in deciding between whether to allow in NGOs or to keep all of the money in the public sectors. And we use the subnational comparative method. Have factors explaining regional variation, we uh, as much as possible quantified these is institutional, political, and economic. So the first two uh, columns on the right show institutional factors, numbers of NGOs, and also state budget subsidies, uh, regional budget subsidies. The second two columns show the political factors, public chamber forums, whether they were held in the regions in what years, and in, whether these uh, regions were initiators in co-financing grants, and the third columns show economic factors. And what we found, um, we can, you can look quickly at this and, and more closely at it later, but what we found this data to show was that political factors mattered most. That is the regions that showed in, in which regional leaderships demonstrated political commitment to reform, 
<clears throat> uh, were most often were the the more successful ones, and those in which leaders showed less or no political commitment were much less successful. Um, we found that institutional factors matter to some extent, and that economic factors really had had no almost no value at all. That poor and rich regions were present among uh, among the beginners and among the uh, among those that that most compliant. One more. So findings, we found um, that political resources have the strongest influence on implementation of outsourcing, that they, uh, <clears throat> that the holding of forums acts as a signaling function as a form of competitive lobbying for the attention of the federal government. This kind of signaling has been seen in other areas, in particular in, in attracting budget funds that they could get attention and showcase achievements. And this really demonstrated, this really got at and measured the, the commitment of the regional leaders. Secondly, that institutional resources matter, that the network of Songos and, and their professional competence was an important factor. In many regions, there was simply too few organizations or they were too small and had too few competences to become included in the, um, in the registries. Though we recognize that some regions, particularly Bashkortostan, actually created gongos, um, gov governmentally, governmentally organized NGOs which they relabeled as songos. And so not all of the organizations in the registries are, general, are genuine civil society organizations. And the government did count pretty much uh, any organizations that it could. Um, economic resources, regional gross domestic, gross regional product per capita was unrelated to the outcome. One more. Okay, so conclusions. We found that our study didn't uh, complement it, although it was somewhat different from the study of a uh, recent study of Chopra, Pap Papa, and Benevolensky, which also found that political in, in political and institutional factors helped most to explain outcomes in an, an earlier stage of, of outsourcing. Uh, they also found that economic factors didn't matter very much, although they're their measurement of political factors was somewhat different. Our research, our project also shows the value of subnational comparisons in identifying key determinants of policy outcomes in Russia's diverse federal system. And it shows that the federal government laid the groundwork for the reform through these grants and co-financing projects. It didn't simply develop legislation and expect the regions to comply. It spent a lot of resources in order to build infrastructure and attitudes that would be positive for compliance. One more slide. Implications. So <clears throat> the study has implications for the Russian government's ability to move away from old status models and to improve cost efficiency. And here we see this reform as up to the three years we looked at having quite modest success, although the government has remained committed and progress has continued. In terms of federal regional relations, we found that regional leaders have agency, that they weigh incentives, excuse me, against costs in that they do make decisions about whether and how much and how to implement federal policies with a substantial degree of autonomy. And finally, that regions compliance with federal mandates is constrained by resources, not only financial resources, uh, limitations of financial resources, such as the famed unfunded mandates, but also by limitations of institutional resources. Many of the criticisms after the fact argued that this legislation was put in place without sufficient attention to whether there were even adequate networks, minimally adequate networks of nonprofit providers in the regions that could have fulfilled this function specified by FC442. Thank you. Это мне отключает звук. 
Uh, Linda, thank you very much. I have a small question about non-profits and non-governmental. In some slides you use non-profit, and in the title it was NGO, like non-governmental organizations. Is it like the same, or you put actors, you know? Yeah, it, it's a good question, and it's one that we, we talked about. The research that we did was all mainly, was pretty much with um, socially oriented non-governmental organizations alone, but some of the legislation and some of the measures look at nonprofits, and those are somewhat different categories. And, and we have talked about how to how to deal with that. So most of our qualitative research deals entirely with um, with socially oriented non-governmental organizations. And this, there are separate categories for those organizations in the regional registers. Um, but the category for which the legislation was written was nonprofits. So, mm. And actually, not only nonprofits, but also some profit making businesses. So we do, there is a little bit of ambiguity in our categories, and, and we, we've, we have addressed that in the paper. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Еще вопросы, коллеги? Можно вопрос задать? Да, я думаю, да. I should think so. Ну, вот, и там есть переводчик-то? Do we have translator? Есть, тогда ну, как угодно. All right, that's good. Either way. Elena and Anna can also participate in answering questions. I think if you put it in English, it'll be better for our mutual understanding. I don't think your mic is on. It is. Oh. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh, okay. So that was a great presentation. Uh, uh, highlighting the factors determining the regional differences between the implementation of the federal legislation and i've got just one question uh three groups of parameters were uh, singled out right so among the institutional ones as a proxy i believe a single proxy you had the uh, quantitative measure a number of ngos on uh, per ten thousand inhabitants right so my question yes. would be uh -huh, my question would be do you think it makes sense to also consider uh, qualitative proxies measuring the institutional uh, agency of the NGOs in the region, like perhaps um, availability of uh, um, major NGO resource centers or uh, whatever. But do you think it would make sense to add also qualitative measures to the institutional capacity of NGOs? It, it would absolutely make sense if we can find a qualitative measure that is available across even most regions. We, we took most of the, the, uh, the data from the, the, the Ministry of Economic Development did a huge federation wide study of the implementation of the legislation and we used data from that study and then other economic data. And yes, if, if there is any any uh, any measure or any indicator you could suggest of quality that we could would work across the federation. The problem is there are so many different factors. Some organizations are very small, um, and there are a lot of other issues with the adequacy of the NGOs. Some of them have to do with how rigid the legislation is about the requirements for service providers and whether those requirements can be loosened to allow. NGOs to to uh, to function. So, but if you have some suggestions for for qualitative measure, we would be we would be happy to include them. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is I mean, you you can email any of us if you know. Mm -hmm. I know there are places that have resource centers, but it has to be some measure that's more or less comparable across at least most of the cases. Yeah, I also think so. Thank you. Коллеги, еще вопросы? Да, вот если можно... Конечно, Владимир Борисович. Yes, Владимир Борисович. Uh -huh. uh, ну, well. uh, значит, я хотел бы на русском языке... I'd like to, to say it in Russian. Uh, 
и к аудитории. So that I, I could speak to my Russian-speaking audience as well. И к сейчас я. Let me switch my channel so that I that I'll be free of interference of the English translation. So I'd like to speak also to the the Russian-speaking audience as well as to the Russian-speaking authors, co-authors of this research paper. First of all, all three co-authors, I would like to thank all three of you for the most interesting work you've done. And the study itself, I have no questions about the study itself. It's been done to the highest degree of uh, accuracy and neatness in methodological terms, very precise. And so today, the way it's been presented and uh, described in the most clear way, at least as far as I'm concerned, and I'm uh, also immersed, engaged in this topic. So thank you to our colleagues for having noticed my work as well as, uh, as co-authors. Indeed, we came to practically identical uh, insights and conclusions, very similar kind of research. However, I do have questions regarding uh, the opinion of the esteemed colleagues with, with regard to strategic uh, prospects of, for the development of such outsourcing. It's a known fact that uh, that uh, the goal set at the federal level was to in terms of the f size of funding the volume of uh, funding uh, non-governmental uh, uh, providers of social services so they could perform I would account for, let's say, 10% of the overall volume of such services in terms of in financial terms, 10% uh, of the budget of the regions be spent on, on social programs, social services were meant to be, uh, to go to, to non-governmental uh, providers of such services. What's your opinion? Uh, to what, how realistic was this goal for, for all the Russian regions? Or is it uh, maybe for some of the Russian regions? What do you think? Will there be, will this goal be achieved uh, for the most part by all regions? or maybe only by some of the regions. My second, the second aspect of the same question, basically. According to your expert assessment, uh, would it make sense to try and, to, uh, and achieve uh, such goal all over the place, all across the board? Because after all, institutional legacy in, in, in our country, in terms of uh, state sector in the social sphere, it is uh, it's uh, quite uh, significant. And does it make sense to set ourselves the goal of uh, maybe stage by stage, but still uh, in detail and across the board, across the regions, to try and change this kind of legacy? What's your assessment? Uh, does it uh, is do we need to aspire to, to towards this, or maybe in some regions, uh, maybe we could m keep the same situation as it is, or perhaps, uh, or maybe just the other way around. Maybe we should we should try, and f or we should we try to force everyone to apply there. So in terms of this overall strategy, what do you think? Do we need to try and uh, implement it at all costs? all across the regions or should we take into account some features of some regions?
can I ask you a question? It the it ten percent actually seems not a an unrealistic goal, but but in the Ministry of Economic Development study, they seem to categorize regions that had less than fifteen percent as as sort of regions that had potential. That is, they seem to have to implicitly expect a much a much higher than ten percent level. I, if the level were ten percent, we could. If, if the goal were ten percent of uh, non-state provision, we would see many more regions as being successful as having met the goal. Uh, I'm sorry, Elena. Could you ten percent provision? Uh, uh, you mean of services which? Uh, which are rendered in accordance with law 442. Right. They, they, they look at the proportion of non-state providers in the regional provider registries. Yeah, but uh, there are two kinds of registries, as, as you might know, as as I understand, uh, for uh, in your uh, research, you refer to the registry of human service providers. Right. This is law 442. Mm -hmm. But the presidential goal of uh, surpassing 10% relates to expenditures on all social <laughs> programs, including, you know, education and health, which is a much more magnificent uh, strategic goal. And it is in this respect that I ask my question. Do you think uh, it is uh, it is necessary to aspire this Goal, given the current situation in Russia's uh, social services system overall. Uh, Linda, would you like to respond, or I can also comment a little bit why don't here? You, I, I think it's not realistic, but why don't you guys comment? Uh, Yes, it's, uh, I don't know, I decided to speak English now, but I can switch into Russian as well. Uh, so, uh, Linda, I, I hope you can hear me as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, Vladimir, thanks a lot for your question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this uh, goal of 10 percentage is really broader. Uh, I mean, it doesn't cover only uh, those services that are provided to uh, social services that are provided by uh, non-profit organizations uh, arranged by the 442 federal law. So um, I think, I mean, your question relates to broader perspective mm -hmm. of this outsourcing. Uh, so, uh, but when it comes to our analysis and our research, my understanding is that, of course, it's not feasible uh, to actually uh, um, settle this kind of goal for uh, Russian Federation, which is represented by so a variety. So, so uh, actually um, uh, um, complicated variety of territories. Uh, so it is not feasible. Th this is my, my, my understanding. Uh, secondly, I would like to respond to the first, uh, first part of your question concerning the uh, uh, socio-economical de de development of Russian regions. I think we are all aware about the pandemic situation that uh, will definitely bring uh, long-term uh, consequences for Russia and all other countries. So I'm, I'm more than sure that, uh, that we will see slowdown in many senses. Uh, also, uh, in this uh, sphere of outsourcing of social services towards nonprofit organizations and social enterprises. So uh, that would be my comment. And thanks a lot for your question. Uh, yes, uh, colleagues, before I mean, we may send you the paper for your comment.
Я боюсь, что нам надо прервать эту очень интересную дискуссию, потому что у нас еще есть два докладчика. Но очень жалко, потому что правда очень интересно и живо, и очень бы хотелось иметь возможность это продолжить. Тем не менее, давайте двигаться дальше, и у нас тоже коллектив авторов, это Барина Фабанкина Белик Поликова, который будет рассказывать об атласе обеспеченности населения, субъектов Российской Федерации, культурными благами. Я так понимаю, что докладчика будет два, это будет Александр Александрович Беликов и Татьяна Селовна Банкина, правильно? Татьяна Банкина. Сергей Баринов. Понятно. Понятно. Ну тогда включайте вашу презентацию, и мы очень ждем ваш рассказ. Пока вы ее включаете, я напомню, что все, кто регистрировался на пресс-конференцию, ставили галочку о том, что они в курсе, что ведет запись, и все презентации записи будут в открытом доступе. Поэтому, если кто-то что-то не успел, не волнуйтесь, вы потом можете это еще посмотреть на сайте Вашингтон-Канал. Uh, this conference again uh, at our site. Mm -hmm. Let me start off. Uh, uh, introduction does not need any illustrations, so thank you, colleagues, for your invitation to this conference. Last year, with a team of colleagues, uh, on the invitation of Tatiana Bankina, we did a study to study regions in terms of provision uh, of people with amenities, cultural amenities. The context of this uh, research is, should be quite clear. Of course, provision of cultural amenities is an important thing. It's one of the priorities of the activities of the government until 2024, which is why this particular study was actually carried out uh, and was part of the agenda. In today's modern management practice, provision of amenities is studied in the context of social management activities to provide access. And uh, so this paradigm of equal access to cultural amenities definitely was within the framework of our study was the main point which we're looking at. So the team of authors is here on slides. We, we worked out this atlas of provision of cultural amenities for the population, which is the topic of our uh, presentations of the main results. The report consists of three parts. First, let me clarify the methodology, which is quite simple, actually, so it will not take much time. Uh, the bulk of the report will be actually a description of the differences between regions of the Russian Federation in terms of provision of cultural amenities that we uh, identified. And in conclusion, uh, I'm going to comment on the main conclusions and patterns and, and, co and connections with the socioeconomic uh, factors. And also we indicated some uh, measures that were adopted as recommendations for management, uh, for management activities. So as I promised, I want to start off with methodology. The methodology of the study is quite uh, straightforward. We looked at the statistical indicators and the atlas basically consists of such statistical indicators and calculated uh, indicators and uh, indices. Statistical is from the Ministry of Culture. They fall into three topic theme-based uh, sets. First, uh, indicators to do with access, uh, square meters per person. Second group, financial indicators, expenditure per capita, overall expenditure of organizations, all to do with finance. And the third, infrastructure of uh, indices. So every index that we came up with uh, in our study, and there were five uh, in total, they each consist of three such components. We, just, we tried not to, to make our structure of the study not too complicated. But as I said, we developed five indices, each index, uh, to be able to add apples to oranges. In a, uh, uh, we used the normalization procedure, statistical indicators. We use the simple model. So the value of the indicator for particular region minus the value for the smallest uh, sampling. Uh, 
that occur divided by the difference between the maximum and the minimum values, which is one of the main uh, methods. And so very fairly uh, simple way, and we arrived at the values of our targeted in each region, after which we put uh, all the subjects regions into five groups. So the basis for such grouping was the value of the index for a particular region relative to the average index value. So that group uh, close to the average value, that was the group of, uh, of average uh, value regions. And, and then the very different and slightly different, very different, if it's slightly different, it uh, was a half of the standard uh, deviation. Those that uh, were different more than half standard deviation, but less than one standard deviation, that was in a positive way. That was four regions with the higher values. The regions that were different within the same range, but in a negative uh, direction, there was uh, regions with a lower value. And two polar uh, groups, next slide, two polar groups are the regions that were different by one, one deviation in a positive way, group five, regions with the maximum value and the minimum value. So, so based on such grouping, we came up with our maps. Next, I want to talk uh, about the results we obtained for each of those indices that's across the five spheres of culture media, starting off with museums. In fact, I want to show you in more detail uh, our indicators in the case of museums, and the rest I'll spend less time on. When, we, when analyzing provision, uh, provision of museum services for 1,000 population, you can see a great uh, uh, exceeding uh, leadership of uh, Eastern Siberia and Far East, uh, sparse populated areas. So clear reasons for uh, leadership. There's still museums there, well, but people are gone, people have left. Next, uh, the share of museums with access to the internet, the provision of, uh, it turned out it's a fair, uh, this problem has been resolved on a massive scale, good news, but still a big disproportion, lack of proportion. Now, jumping ahead, let me mention that we identified similar issues for other spheres, not just museums. So, so next slide. And finally, this, the condition of buildings were that house museums, serious disbalances there. A whole number of regions with more than 60% of buildings are for museums are dilapidated buildings that require capital repairs. Very serious, quite a serious issue today. Next slide. To sum up uh, the results for three indices, we get this but, uh, index where we see the exceeding provision uh, in Far East uh, and Eastern Siberia. And so those are the leadership regions in this. Now, the main results on the provision are as follows. The average value is uh, 0.33 of normalized index. The difference between maximum minimum is more than 10 times over. So the proportion of the provisional museums are great gaps between the regions, great differences. So it fails to fit at all into in the concept of equal access, no equal access there. And some regions, as I mentioned, they have uh, indices far below average values, which is a big issue in itself too. Most of those are in the North, Northern Cauc Caucasus area, publics of the North Caucasus. The next slide, uh, I want to talk about grouping. Grouping, uh, now you can see the difference along the line of uh, West, uh, South, North, East. So next uh, we move to the second part of our analysis, which is the Atlas of Theaters. Now we're moving to, to the series of theaters. Next. As I said, I'm not going to talk about particular indices. Let's talk about the overall indices. Here's the provision of services uh, and conditions uh, for theaters. The picture is very different from museums. You can see the regions of the North, quite on quite on the opposite, not so big on theaters, but very visible leadership in many regions of the Eastern Siberia. Migration art flow played its part there too. 
So the Soviet time uh, theater is still there, just like museums, while the number of users have gone down quite a lot. We still see great lagging of the Caucasian regions like still. Next slide. To summing up the results we've obtained for theaters, we may note uh, the following. Um, easily, predictably, uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg are hands down leader, leaders there. Because they provide theaters not just for the cities, but for all the population of the country, for tourists, visitors. Well, this gap is quite quite serious, not as big as in the case of museums, but six times uh, different between maximum and minimum values. And the number of regions with above the average uh, value is 12. So that's to say there's a few well-provided regions. Uh, and of course, Moscow and St. Petersburg stand out there quite a lot. Next slide, when analyzing the types of regions, you can see the, no particular patterns there. Whilst in the case of museums, you could see the axis uh, northwest to uh, northeast to southwest. Here, here there's no such pattern, no such dividing line. And the results it is provision of services for concerts. Next slides in, in, in index for concerts, concert organizations. Quite an extensive differentiation, just as was the case with the previous amenities. Very high level provisions. Chukotka, Magadan, and Krasnoyarsk, that's the regions of North and East. Also the European North regions, uh, European part of Russia. And Southern, it came as a surprise, is South, south of Siberia. Next slide, differences between the maximum, maximum minimum value, as big a difference as was the case in museums, more than 10 times difference. We can see the, the provision of theater, of concert organizations, the maximum difference in terms of kinds of services. The minimum among the regions with the minimum value, it's visible, uh, hype, share of southern steppe like uh, plain regions camera to sky regions that is the regions which were cultivated a long time ago so it's it's an issue also sevastopol which is the region that has been joined to russia and didn't have enough time to develop such infrastructure next slide uh, we see here too the visible problem zone is the region of this of the southern Urals and the, and the far east. Uh, so it's uh, it's the periphery regions inside Russia, which is a big issue because the population of this part of the country they have big difficulties uh, to, with accessing foreign service as well as accessing uh, the capital. So this internal hinterland periphery, which requires a lot of special support, which was uh, mentioned many times by, by analysts They're experiencing difficulties there, low level indices. So it's a pretty bad uh, trend, which would require a lot of management to turn around. Next, uh, libraries. Let's look at the index libraries based on the results of our analysis. Traditionally, uh, the regions of North still in the leadership with the legacy of Soviet time. The regions of the Caucasus are behind also tradition. Also, besides the Central Russia, Moscow region is also quite uh, behind. On the one hand, it could be written off through the proximity of Moscow, but we understand libraries are the kind of service that, that users get actually where they live. So it's very rare that people travel long distances to libraries. Uh, so typically it's, it's a matter of pro proximity uh, of nearby locations. So this kind of lagging behind is a, is a fairly uh, alarming signal. Next is the inter-regional differentiation as far as library service is the minimal. Uh, so, so in this sphere, in terms of equal access of populations to such services, it's, it's fairly equal across all regions more than half of regions have uh, above the average index. That means uh, it's 
the difference among the regions are fairly small and traditional leaders of Far Eastern are still there. And next slide, in grouping the regions, we see a very clear uh, line, north versus south. Northern regions are quite uh, successful, high level of urbanization and migration outflow. Regions such as Volga Vyatsky region or European North in, in blue, they're doing okay in, in this regard. But because the Soviet legacy is still there, while pe people have left, and the high level of uh, people living in cities, better situation with libraries. As for rural libraries, that situation is definitely worse. So agrarian areas have a lower indices for libraries, and of course, regions that are attractive for migrants, such as Moscow and, and Leningrad regions. In those regions, the, even the number of buildings with libraries is uh, lagging behind the growth of the population. And finally, a final section is uh, uh, clubs. We're not talking about night clubs. Let's make it clear. We're talking about all kinds of club, like organization, including uh, House of Pioneers, uh, House of Creativities in rural areas. Again, there's a line between North and South, quite clear, also in the rural areas. The provision of such services in rural areas is quite noticeably behind the cities. Next, inter-regional uh, differences in provision of clubs, just as libraries, not so great as, as was the case with theaters and museums, but still, it's still there. Next uh, slide, let me move to the final part of my report. It will take a couple of more minutes. Basically, the conclusion, summing up our results. First, inter-regional differences, provision of population with the services of museums, concert organizations, service and amenities is very great. As of today, it exceeds uh, significantly what would appear to be paradigm in terms of the paradigm of equal access to uh, amenities and social services. So this is the issue which needs to be resolved, first of all, by the federal authority. Second point, those differences uh, tend to vary from kinds of services to between different kinds of service. And third, uh, outsiders regions, uh, they tend to be the same. Next slide, we see those uh, patterns of interregional uh, First, north versus south, the greater the number of population, the, the higher the level of indexes. So the provision in rural areas is much behind uh, uh, the cities, even though the level of urbanization is more or less constant. First, second difference between the center and periphery, with the more active uh, migration and outflow from a territory, the indices improve. But regions that host population, because despite their better budgets, for instance, the population of Moscow region, lots of taxpayers, very good budgets, despite the fact that club fund is uh, lagging behind. So clearly require maybe support of federal center or some kind of dialogue between the federal center and the regions in terms of improving such provision. And next slide, we can see the, the regions with good situation, uh, particularly the far east of Russia, as well as Moscow and St. Petersburg. And in terms of most of the indices, Central Russia, Central. But this regions with a dire situation, North Caucasus, which basically fits with our initial hypothesis, that's what we expect. And suddenly, something we didn't expect at all, when we begin with is agglomeration of two, uh, around two capitals, the Moscow region and the Leningrad regions. To conclude my report, let me dwell on the main recommendations uh, and practical activities, actions. To overcome the existing disproportions will call for active application of modern information technologies. Because where we can, we're not able to give physical access, we need to be able to make up for this uh, through online, for instance, conference like our conference today, online. Second, one needs uh, uh, way we are, are not able to build, to build new buildings. There should be new ways of to deliver things, uh, networks of delivery. It should be to improve uh, provision of culture amenities. Of course, also steps to do to uh, 
to stimulate uh, tourism among young people and special support for cultural services. Uh, also, the possible contribution to be made by the national project on culture. There's a whole lot of provisions there, which is important. As of today, the current provision of service amenities from the angle we're looking at. So the measures taken to support, they should take into account the current uh, indices of regions and the difference, existing differences between regions. Thank you very much for your attention. Большое спасибо, очень интересно. Коллеги, есть ли у вас вопросы? Very much. Very interesting Any questions? Okay. I have questions mm -hmm. again. Конечно. Sure. Mm -hmm. Anna Tarasenko. Could you go back to the slide which featured the uh, estimation of this index? That's one of the first slides on methodology. When you say estimation, what do you, what exactly do you mean? It's the actually this the slide of methodology. Well, I have three of those, but let's uh, let's let's take those slides and. We have a list of indicators. We have the mechanism of normalization. All right. Can you go to the previous slide? Yes. Do I get you right? Uh, the, the, the objective was to measure the provision of services because when you, as you spoke of this, uh, I was trying to understand what is the central phenomenon that you were studying. Exactly. The, our goal was to study the provision of services. But since, uh, as far as budget service, uh, as the budget sphere versus commercial, it's not possible to measure the sales of the service. Typically, the budget sphere is, is for free. So we're looking at the state of infrastructure. It's a, it's more uh, indirect way, less direct. I have a short comment on this. I understand the pro uh, in methodological problem here, measurement, but it seems that those indicators tend to lead us away from the provision of amenities. We don't have here events maybe put on by museums for children uh, who are not able to gain, to gain access to paid for services. So this list could be quite long. It appears that those indices are rather technical. I'm sorry for such uh, definition. But I, mean, I, would, I would suggest perhaps uh, Perhaps you could use uh, another concept, maybe a resource provision for museums, theaters, uh, more likely than provision of services. I understand it's a methodological issue. I had to grapple with this myself uh, more than once, but that's what my comment is about. Thank you very much. It's a very valuable comment. Here, I would like to add, if I may, the thing is, by law, amenity is, is, is defined as conditions and services. Maybe it was not so evident in this presentation, but we did try to um, identify from statistics practically all indicators. We've, we've lost connection for a moment. Uh, so in our version of the report, uh, the table of indices uh, more than 20 different in indices for each kind of activity, each ki kind of cultural activity, which includes, among others, number of services, uh, not just uh, conditions, but also volume of activity, the structure of activity. So we pulled out all we could from this. So it's, it's like an integral uh, index which uh, falls into main blocks here as the groups, including financial conditions. There are lots of factors. We'll look separately at the budget fin for financing as well as paid for uh, basis, uh, paid for services. So from this uh, 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 angle, it was not so easy to a presentation. But I suggest you would look at the, all the list uh, of 
the table or in that indices that we used. As with thanks to normalization, we were able to compare and relate uh, them amongst themselves. Thank you very much, Tatiana Solomon. That's the case. Not to, not, to, not to waste time on technical switching from channel to channel. We do have, I just mentioned, I, we have a table uh, featuring number of uh, population for one museum, or one uh, Philharmonic concert. Uh, so we have those indices. So you had a separate category of children's uh, institutions with well, mm -hmm. uh, statistics of the Ministry of Culture. So, so we looked at the institutions uh, that, are, yeah. that are managed by Ministry of Culture. We didn't look at the institutions managed by the Ministry yeah. of Education. I think we need to go to the next step, uh, uh, report, which is the title of the lessons for Russia from history of American children. Two authors from Mr. Zhavon. Yinovsky will speak, Konstantin Yinovsky will speak. Ah, ura. Uh, good evening. What's your convenience for you to put on a presentation or shall I do it for you? Yeah. Can you? Can you see it? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Even though we're slightly uh, uh, of the mainstream of this discussion, but uh, let me thank you for this opportunity in the course of this crisis. It becomes clear that uh, often the, the, the government uh, not always successful in providing uh, amenities. So it uh, makes sense to have a good, uh, flexible private system, which would be complementary for to the government uh, provided services. So the Russian tradition, of course, uh, Russia did have such tradition too, his historically. Moscow has lots of such monuments to such charity, uh, heritage. So after the collapse of the, of the Russian Tsar regime, it was a gradual restoration of this tradition, where not just the government, but uh, the private charity could uh, assume functions of uh, 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 performed by the government initially. So the experience of yes is the only living uh, example, a big scale example, a case of such a uh, tradition. It's very important, uh, not just in terms of the colossal volume. We're talking here about strictly private resources, uh, 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 which we can uh, identify from uh, tax authorities through tax uh, exemption. Uh, but so, which is why the history is, of this has been quite well studied. The whole situation is quite fairly clear, well studied. So the factors have been studied that uh, contribute towards the quality of donations, uh, the best uh, practices, uh, the experience of uh, failures and uh, controversial practices too. So the structured donations, this is the biggest sector, uh, is religious organizations. That's not what you might assume. This particularly, it, it's not so much expenditure on building churches, even though it's there. 31%, it's mostly just uh, ordinary expenses on uh, health care programs, education programs. So just a uh, fairly expenditure. 50 years ago, this share 
was but talking about donations that are distributed uh, through religious organizations. So, so it was almost half of all the donations. Now, historical lessons. So historically, it was a uh, Ang Anglican church, which is a state church, uh, Episcopal church. So it's a state-run organ providing for the poor and also collecting during the colonial period. You, you can uh, read from Franklin's uh, memoirs about private uh, charity, which was often associated to in terms of symbolic connection with the, uh, with Anglican and Episcopal churches. It's, it's like a royal scientific society, which was not funded by the, by the government. But a big price had to be paid for this situation. Even though after the War of Independence, Activities of those organizations was seen as um, not legal. So the private charity uh, flourished later, even though, even at that time, there were still attempts by the local authorities to try and help the poor from the pockets of the tax. Here, we should remind of the main condition for private charity. It's not something you, you can easily find identified in American literature because American authors take it for granted. The key condition is the same as for business. One needs proper protection of the life and freedom of private owner and for one or two, but for one or two generations, longer lasting period. So the power of American charity in the 19th century was based not so much on big resources as on the effective rules of the use and utilization, aiming especially at able-bodied recipients. So such uh, assistance was uh, provided after the personal study of the circumstances of specific then a set of measures to, to make sure that uh, able-bodied people will not get addicted to receiving aid and assistance. And, and in a number of cases, uh, help was needed to restore family ties. So such uh, assistance was provided to. So according to the literature, uh, people tend to be more willing to help people who are like themselves, who, whom they see as one of them, as also to people who are in a difficult situation that uh, contributors have experienced themselves. In the so that makes them easier for them to relate to such uh, people who need help. So who tends to, to make more contrib contributions? Uh, is it secular liberals or is it right to wing uh, conservative, uh, conservatives? Based on the sociological data, was based on the of the IRS tax exemptions. So typically it's referred to in literature as the main uh, variable in statistics. So that shows the conservative counties tend to contribute greater number, uh, portion of the income compared to liberal counties.
we only ran checks only on, on one state, state of California, and one could see it, it's quite visible. Also, it appears that the quality of donations is quite different. Conservatives typically do it through religious, uh, uh, through small specialized uh, um, outfits, just like it was done in the 19th century. While secular uh, liberals tend to prefer at workplace uh, contributions, often uh, as a collection of uh, donations. So fundraising may be quite powerful, resources are quite big, but the chain between the contributor towards the recipient tends to be quite long. And so there's no personal involvement of the contributor. The first significant visible interest of the federal authorities towards social themes in the US is the administration of Senator Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. The, but the, the base level was zero level at the time. But, but during the Great Depression under Franklin Roosevelt, in economic literature, the historians often not that the, the economic measures were similar, but the help to the poor ones was different. Because Hoover believed that the private organizations uh, did a better job on this, whilst Roosevelt uh, uh, began to Uh, began to carry out social programs. Uh, so some authors tend to, tend to explain this by the need to develop political machine for re-election. The 20th century, also in the 1920s, it was a period of time as, as the medium-sized organizations emerged, uh, so the category of professional functionaries uh, and so the principal agent uh, issue emerged where agents out of good intentions to try and help everyone began to interact with social bureaucrats and effectively stepped out of the control of uh, magic so in many of the programs uh, they were presented in ideological packaging. So the message was that uh, the contributors are rich and that's why you, uh, the poor ones, you are getting this, uh, this uh, uh, aid. And also major politicized projects emerged, such as the Committee for Now, for well-known organization with political uh, aims for election and to it also had connections with federal and it wasn't wasn't the the only example as we did a project we found examples of other non-ngos that but those are just uh, exceptions to confirm the rule so the good quality is appears to be provided by the NGOs that are not looking for support of the government. Now the practice of umbrella organization that I mentioned, uh, there's some issues, not just because of the longer chains between uh, contributor and recipient, but also disincentivizing uh, and uh, because of non-discrimination requirement. Because there's no, uh, no opportunity to, to focus uh, aid on, on a particular group. So the access should be equal to a wider base. Uh, so, so it extends the assistance to a wider base, but uh, 
эксперимент очень простой э, поиск по штатам и по, по направленной деятельности. Э, огромное количество, десятки тысяч организаций, условно uh, such as uh, when I mentioned uh, helping the soldiers, uh, also, the vet also training uh, dogs for disabled people. Also, there's a classical case of Apalchen, uh, an organization that uh, helping uh, people in dire material conditions, so that also psychological help to mothers who've lost new babies. So the main lessons that we think uh, may be derived from the American experience, first, uh, that's what's uh, a big difference between Russia and US, in terms of good climate for developing charity, as, as a good climate uh, business, but one or two generations longer guarantees. Second, uh, outsourcing of services in the long run. It's uh, incentives for organizations uh, that fulfill such orders. Next, and the state is not supposed to support any particular confessions because the First Amendment. Yes, the state should be separate from religion but there should be no, but should be no separation for, in terms of recipients of assistance, uh, hospitals, schools, uh, the needy one, people. Because that would cut off uh, the source of, of their incentives. And finally, for civic society, first, uh, not to politicize the problem of interaction of such organizations and, uh, and the authorities, so not to repeat the experiment of uh, war for ind independence. To have respect for moral values and motives of uh, contributors and to understand that uh, it's not a better idea to try and help a stranger than to help uh, somebody you know. Also helping from the own pocket, not just making promises uh, for... Indeed, I have a question. What I'd like to say... Do I cause uh, this noise interference? Can we take off your presentation of the screen? Maybe you could stop the demonstration of the screen at the top. Let us all switch off our except for Marie. Can you hear me? Well, I think it's a very interesting presentation, actually, because the history of the development of charity in foreign countries is something that we don't know so well. Even though it's modern state, of course, something we study very closely, which is why I want to thank our colleagues for the substantive and useful uh, report for us. And the question I have, 
может быть, с той аннотацией, которую вы присылали. In connection with the annotations you sent as request for this conference uh, in the past. You didn't dwell so much on, on this now, but still, maybe you could clarify. Do you think that uh, in modern conditions, that the private charity might replace uh, uh, social welfare state oh. or would you say that the social state needs to fulfill its tasks uh, still but being a welfare state the social service social support provided uh, by the state uh, since it fails to meet all the needs for social support that society has so these efforts of the social state should be complemented by the maximally extensive as 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 extensive as possible uh, development of private charity based on principles that you've described so the question is is the choice between the welfare state versus private charity in your view all these uh, phenomena should coexist perhaps and mutually complementing each other thank you for your question it's uh, quite obvious that development uh, of private charity is a process uh, of it's a historically long process uh, pr for generations. So, and uh, even as if we were to assume that private charity would uh, eventually replace state uh, social support in Russia, it would take several generations. Uh, so the participants now in this discussion will, will be the very advanced age by the so there's an objective uh, problem is that state is not always a tolerant partner in the spheres where private organizations operate uh, and sometimes government uh, public organizations the state uh, shows that it's unwilling to give time uh, to private organizations, but still in the US, they're, they're, somehow they manage to, to cooperate. Such cooperation, not as, not, not as good, but still, uh, it's still there in Israel, private public partnerships. But we need to be, need to understand one, it's still better than in most of Europe. When we look at the at Western Europe, with the history of a lot of uh, charity work uh, in the past, now the share of private charity uh, has uh, dramatically. So, in answering your question, yes, of course, they 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 need to coexist, even though it's not as simple as might, it might appear. Thank you. I agree. Thank you very much. Any more questions? No questions. Hello, Mr. Vladimir. 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 It's more about the text of the annotation that you sent, uh, not so much about the presentation. It's also about the interaction between uh, business corporate charity versus private uh, donations. Based on what I read in your an annotation, what you appear to refer to as real uh, charity is, is private charity, but what's provided by business might be motivated by some other considerations. Uh, uh, but in any, at any rate, you're speaking of 
private donations as uh, authentic, uh, true donations. So I'd like to to get a comment. This. In formal terms, corporate business is a private business. Uh, so what we had in mind, uh, we have we have much bigger report on some issues of corporate uh, charity. One issue with corporate uh, charity is that it, it makes the chain between contributors much very long. One wishes it were shorter. For instance, if, if the objective of project is to build a modern hospital, of course, uh, it calls for the kind of resources that uh, uh, would be difficult to collect uh, from uh, private individuals and would uh, and would have to make uh, such collections every year just to maintain such a hospital so of course we regarded corporate uh, charity as a, as a variety of kind of private uh, charity that but with one difference is we need to identify specifically something we mentioned in the presentation situation where at workplace contribution collects from its employees contributions uh, for for the benefit of large umbrella charity entities it's still a, a private charity but it's not as good uh, quality based on a few interviews we conducted uh, So when a, when an employee gets an email from a from the superiors whether they've made donations, something gets that gets collect subtracted from the from the accountants and from through the accounting office, people just forget about this. Uh, whilst uh, being personally engaged is when you know whom you whom you are trying to help. That's what, so formally speaking, this is still private charity, but it's not essentially such. Uh, can I ask another short question? Well, sir, as far as the motivation, it seemed to me, this paradigm seemed to be rather limited. When, as you speak of this charity, you mostly consider to the factors of compassion and self-identification but actually as far as factors of charity according to studies there's far wider set of factors not limited to these because that leaves uh, out such outside such factors as culture of charities traditions uh, social capital or inter intergenerational transmissions. So there's a whole lot of factors that uh, lie outside of the immediate comp experience of compassion. So I felt maybe this coverage was not quite sufficient in terms of the importance of uh, factors. Thank you. The, in a broad sense, the culture does include uh, such concepts as uh, Uh, as religion if a person feels that by making contribution they are doing good deed in the eyes of the god the god it's a good thing because uh, the thing about a religious institution is the capacity to mobilize one's one of those important powerful uh, incentives for the nations let's uh, taking America again even people who are quite secular and quite indifferent about religion they still operate within this cultural matrix because uh, America is a country of religious donations so the discussion itself is who uh, contributes more Only in America you can actually imagine this kind of discussion in America, it's, a, it's an obvious fact. Everybody assumes that uh, providing money for charity is a good thing. Whomever provides money for, contributes money for charity is a good person. That's a, it's an, a, an assumption that everybody makes in America. It's part of culture. 
But, but it also relates to the habit of first helping people around you, your neighbors, your relatives, your community, and then by and by, as you, while you live in this culture, and especially uh, through because of powerful modern media, which was not the case in in the past. Now it's. I personally feel compassionate for somebody living on, on the other, on at the other end of the world, which was not used to be the case. But now, thanks to the media, it's it's still it's still essentially a form of compassion, compassion through the media. Report. Can I ask a question? Yes, one because our time is up. Uh, did I get it right? Uh, Maybe I'll put it in a primitive, ter primitive terms. That's in the charity work. One should not uh, identify religious people versus atheists. One should have the same attitude. So what? That's as far as your recommendations towards the end. What I was trying to say was, was this from the standpoint of many people, politicians too, there are two kinds of people. Let's say religious people versus non-religious people. The problem is, quite often, uh, with, with this kind of approach, even the interpretation of the first amendment of the US Constitution is, goes as follows, spending money uh, as a Christian person would spend, or Buddhist or Jew, that's uh, prohibited. That comes from the First Amend Amendment. But if it's done by militant atheists, that's fine, because, because he or she is non-religious. What are we saying? A person who believes uh, in God versus a person who believes in the uh, non-existence of God there should be no there should be no difference in treatment or attitudes because they're doing the same things essentially thank you that's very important social donations we have one danger in this Zoom system. The advantage yeah. of person-to-person uh, -person conferences when people stay behind and the network, something we tend to lose, uh, tend to lose uh, because of Zoom. Maybe we can stay on, even though broadcasting is uh, finished. But let's try and stay on. Because we had 